In Lower Manhattan, keeping a watchful eye over the gleaming towers of Wall Street and America's financial heart, is the District Court of the Southern District of New York. It's been the backdrop for some of the biggest financial and fraud trials in history. Last week, a dark car pulled up outside the court. A 30-year-old man with a mop of unruly dark curls, looking a little uneasy in a suit and tie, got out, blinking at the scrum of flashing cameras around him. For the federal court, another groundbreaking case was just getting started. Disgraced crypto king Sam Bankman fried pleaded not guilty in a Manhattan federal court Tuesday. This is a story about more than crypto. It's a cautionary tale that exposes flaws in the worlds of celebrity, Wall Street, and even Washington, D.C. The lawyer behind the proposed class action suit alleges that it could only have been this successful with the help of celebrities and influencers. I wasn't viewing it as a partisan exercise. I was not donating to one party to beat the other one in the general election. In just a matter of months, Sam Bankman-Fried went from being celebrated as a financial genius and the acceptable face of crypto. All right, let's talk. Uh, let's talk a bit Kroger? about Sam Bankman-Fried because you you want to, you know, you do. Well, Sam Bankman-Fried stealing the headlines. They call him the J.P. Morgan of crypto. <laughs> the Michael Jordan of crypto, if you will. <laughs> to a spectacular downfall. I didn't knowingly commit fraud. I don't think I committed fraud. I didn't want any of this to happen. Um, I was certainly not nearly as competent as I thought I was. What does it all mean for the future of cryptocurrencies? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, Sam Bankman-Fried, the public unravelling of a crypto whiz kid. Crypto Bahamas was billed as Davos in flip-flops. It was an invitation-only event for people within the crypto industry, organised by one of the industry's crypto barons, a chap called Sam Bankman-Fried, known as SBF. And his crypto business was called FTX. Katie Prescott is the business technology editor at The Times. She covers everything from Meta and Google to startups by UK university students. But today, her story takes us to the sun, sand and crypto conferences of the Caribbean in May 2022. This was their inaugural event in the Bahamas where his business was based. The Bahamas has built itself as the home of crypto and it's done a lot to try and encourage crypto businesses there. So you can imagine it's a beachside resort with lots of people ready to discuss the crypto industry, but also a sprinkling of glamour too. So Giselle Bunchen was there, the supermodel. For Giselle, she has never been just a supermodel. Today, we'll discuss where Giselle and Sam share passion for philanthropy stems from, since these were decisions that originated long before Sam founded FTX and Giselle was discovered at a mall in Brazil. Katy Perry, Orlando Bloom, and then as well, some really top politicians. There's one image from Crypto Bahamas that really stands out for me, and that is Sam Bankman-Fried sitting on stage with Tony Blair, and Bill Clinton. And it's a really striking image because you've got these two world leaders sitting with someone who looks incredibly scruffy. SBF famously has a mop of dark curly hair and always wears a scruffy pair of shorts and a t-shirt. And there they are, the three of them sitting on stage. The other thing that's really striking about it is looking at the speakers list. So alongside the people that you might expect from the crypto industry running crypto businesses, there are also people from more well-known companies like PwC, Visa, Mercedes Formula One. It really put him amongst some of the top, most influential people in the world and gave him a huge amount of credibility in this very glitzy, glamorous 
sophisticated event. Whereas before, the crypto industry had been perhaps a bit niche, a bit sidelined, and also people were a bit suspicious of it. I mean, that is extraordinary. And I I imagine if you're being photographed on a stage between Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, you're probably allowing yourself to think you're already making history. A lot of people, though, might not have heard of him. So tell us a bit about Sam Bankman-Fried. Who is he? So Sam Bankman-Fried was born in California in 1992. And he was the son of two academics, two law professors at the very prestigious Stanford University. He was always seen as a gifted student at school. He loved maths. And he went on to study physics and maths at MIT, another really prestigious institution. So you've got a really solidly middle-class child who's following perhaps a very traditional academic path following his academic parents. After university, he went to Wall Street, where he joined a trading firm called Jane Street. Now, Jane Street isn't a sort of classic banking business. People who go there tend to perhaps dress down more than perhaps the classic suit and tie. And it has a reputation for being a bit techie. So he started there and worked for a couple of years trading. And then he left to start his own hedge fund in crypto because he became very interested in cryptocurrencies called Alameda Research. And and just tell us a bit about that. Alameda Research really started when crypto was was becoming a thing, was really booming, and a lot of people were getting interested in it. And what it did essentially is, is he took a lot of the experience that he had on Wall Street and started applying it to crypto. And he looked across the world and saw that there were price differences in cryptocurrencies in different markets. And so by betting on those price changes, you could make money. And, and from that, he started Alameda Research. And then he looked at the infrastructure of crypto and thought there was room for an exchange, so where you could actually buy or sell cryptocurrency. So he decided to start a crypto exchange in 2019 called FTX. And what FTX did is essentially allow the likes of you and me to trade currency. So we could put money in to buy some Bitcoin, for example, or Mm. some Ethereum. Um, And As well as doing that, he also created a token, and this becomes quite important for later in the story. He created a token called FTT. So they made up a currency, FTT, and allow people to trade that as well. And so what he created was, if you think of a standard bank where you have a retail bank where you put your money and then an investment bank where you trade funds, he had those two in his empire. Alameda is the investment bank and and FTX is the traditional bank exchange. Okay. In order to concentrate on FTX, he sort of hands over the running of Alameda to his girlfriend at the time. Tell us a bit about her. Caroline Ellison has a very similar background to SBF. Again, she has academic parents and is a bit of a maths genius. So after he'd established Alameda Research, he persuaded her to come over and join it. And and as you say, she started to take more responsibility at Alameda as he focused on FTX. It is really interesting that they had a relationship. And from all reports, it sounds like that was on off throughout the duration of their professional relationship as well. And later she'd moved to the Bahamas to live with him. Now, she used to blog quite a lot and tweet quite a lot. Now, most of that's been pulled off the internet. But what we have seen from what used to be there was she's spoken about polyamory, so having a relationship with multiple people. And it's reported that when they were in the Bahamas living together, there was a polyamorous relationship between many of the people who were working and running FTX from the Bahamas at the time. She's also written about using drugs. On Twitter, she wrote, nothing like regular amphetamine use to make you appreciate how dumb a lot of normal, non-medicated human experience is. Wow. I mean, you're starting to get a picture here of quite a remarkable little colony in the Bahamas around FTX. Now, at the same time, during the early years that these businesses are being set up, Sam Bankman-Fried becomes really interested in a philosophy called effective altruism. Tell us a bit about that. 
Effective altruism is a philosophy that's been adopted by a lot of people in Silicon Valley. And the idea behind it is that you use evidence and reason to decide how people should give money away. And the idea is that you can earn to give. So it doesn't stop people from earning a lot of money, but in earning, you pledge to give away 10% of your wealth. And just to give you a sense of, of how influential it is, Elon Musk subscribed to it and he tweeted to his followers, this is a close match for my philosophy. And SBF said that by making money, he also wanted to give it away and subscribe to this philosophy. The guy you see next to me is the most generous billionaire in the world. And I found him. Hi, my name is Sam, and this is my story. Last year, this 29-year-old guy donated $50 million. Next year, he's planning to donate $500 million a year. And next decade, he will probably give away more than $10 billion. You got to remember at this time, you know, crypto was seen as a sort of weird corner of the internet. The people who were investing in crypto and designing it are often called crypto bros. And the whole point of developing the currencies in the first place was because people didn't trust the establishment, they didn't trust governments, and they wanted something that would be completely independent of that. Mm. And so Sam Bankman Fried, I think, by subscribing to effective altruism, given his background in traditional academia on Wall Street was absolutely the opposite of that. And I think in many ways became the acceptable face of crypto and sort of bridged this gap between what had been quite niche and something that certainly traditional finance was suspicious of. And people started to think, well, actually, perhaps this guy has worked out a way to make it credible and make it work. It was making a phenomenal amount of money at this stage. FTX is founded in 2019, and by 2022, it's already valued at $32 billion. How does that happen so fast? When it comes to company valuations, they're valued at how much investors are willing to pay for them. So it raised a lot of money from very, very well-established venture capitalists. If you look at some of its backers, they include Sequoia Capital, which is best known for investing in Apple and Google and Instagram. It's a real store of Silicon Valley. The Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. Temasek, which is Singapore's sovereign wealth fund. So all of these companies, which are very, very experienced investors. And as you say, at its last funding round, that valued the business at $32 billion. At 80 investors put $2 billion dollars into the business. And what is so interesting here is that these very well-established companies, you would have thought, would have done very, very extensive due diligence on his business. And they would have trawled through the books and looked at his business plan and worked out exactly what was going on here. And yet it seems that that wasn't really the case. And actually, when you speak to some of the investors who put money in. There's a former finance director from SoftBank, one of the investors, who said it was FOMO. It was fear of missing out. One person invested and then other people didn't want to miss out on the hype. And so they put money in too. And I should say the other thing about Sam Bankman-Fried, which is at odds with the crypto industry, he used to talk a lot about wanting to regulate the industry. So I think like getting regulatory clarity is huge. And I think it's good for everyone. I think it gives customer protection that we're missing right now, real federal oversight, protection against financial crimes, against systemic risk. Do I think it's a win-win to have federal oversight? Most crypto bros don't want any regulation at all. They don't want governments involved. You know, they certainly don't want financial authorities involved. And he was sort of reaching out his hands saying, OK, we do want this. We want to make crypto more well-established, more, more mainstream. So I think I think there was something in that as well that probably attracted investors. And in terms of his influence, you know, he's talking a lot about giving money to charity. He's also donating to political campaigns too. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, and this has been hugely controversial. So Bankman Fried contributed more than seventy million dollars to election campaigns in less than eighty months, and that made him one of America's top political donors. That money bought Bankman Freed a lot of access. The Washington Free Beacon reports that just six months ago, Bankman Freed was at the White House consulting on cryptocurrency regulation. Now, a lot of that 
did go to the Democrats, but also some to the Republicans too. He was spending money across the board. That's intriguing. So it's not ideological necessarily. He's sort of hedging. He starts to become sort of almost like a, a, a cult figure. Tell us a bit about the sort of people who get involved with FTX and its marketing. Well, this is all part of the mystique and part of the marketing, as you say. So he brought celebrities on board to promote the brand. So, for example, Larry David, the comedian, is one of those. And he did an advert for FTX, which the tagline is something like, don't be like Larry, don't miss out on crypto. I call it the wheel. Hmm. I don't think so. What does it do? Where he dresses up in a series of silly costumes throughout the ages and kind of dismisses the wheel. One of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Dismisses the light bulb. <laughs> you know, the implication being crypto is going to be one of the huge next world's biggest inventions. Can I talk to you about something? Yeah, we talked about it. I got another 10 years left, maybe 15. Not bad. This is big. Giselle, the supermodel, was also brought in. What do you think? Are you in? You know what? I'm in. Let's call everyone. Hang on a minute to promote the brand and her husband, Tom Brady. And not only were they promoting it, they were also investors. SBF advertised his business at the Super Bowl, which as you know is like the biggest event in US sport. That's the big time. That really is the big time with the big guys. And then he also bought the naming rights to a stadium in Miami. Time magazine voted him as one of the 100 most influential people of last year. He was on the cover of Fortune magazine. He was a regular spokesperson on telly for the crypto industry. This all has the effect, a cumulative effect, a little bit like with the investors, of making crypto seem mainstream, making it a household name. So he really was seen as a very credible figure, a crypto baron billionaire leading this enormous business that was going to bring crypto to the masses. So, Katie, by early autumn 2022, he is this global figure. He's getting the profiles in the media. He's got the world at his fingertips. All of that starts to change on the 2nd of November when a crypto news site, Coindesk, published an article about Alameda. This is absolutely key to the story. So Coindesk published this report that Alameda Research was in a a precarious situation and it didn't have enough funds to cover its outstanding debts. And looking at its balance sheet, it said that that was full of FTT, which are the tokens that they invented for the business, and also some illiquid tokens. So they weren't able to service their debt, essentially. Just tell us what sort of an impact that article has when it's put out there. What happens? Well, I think you've got to think at the time as well. People were quite jittery about crypto. So there were a couple of high profile collapses last year. The Three Arrows Capital is one of the most controversial names in crypto. The now bankrupt hedge fund was borrowing billions from crypto lenders and as a result, played a central role in this summer's price meltdown. As one of the, its biggest bets... More pain in the world of crypto. Voyager Digital files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection just days after the brokers... And the industry as a whole has been in what they describe as a crypto winter, meaning that the price of cryptocurrency has fallen. So that's the context. And then what happened is the chief exec of Binance, which is a rival cryptocurrency exchange, a guy called Changpeng Zhao, known as CZ, he said that Binance was going to liquidate all of its FTT holdings, which would have been $500 million. CZ is incredibly influential in the crypto industry. So when he wrote that on Twitter, which essentially says, I don't believe in FTT, it triggered a run on the FTX exchange. So people were trying to pull their money out. And at one point, they stopped withdrawals. And Sam Bankman-Fried said he was desperately trying to raise money to sort the business out. Now, Binance and, and CZ said that they thought they might be able to step in and buy it. But then CZ tweeted that he was going to abandon the plan because there were suspicions over the business. So that again meant that the credibility of FTX, which had once been so high, was really shot. The implication being that CZ had looked at the books and thought, uh-uh, this isn't one for us. 
Wow. And was that the, the final nail? Absolutely. CZ tweeting that and Binance pulling its money made people who had money in the exchange, like a run on a bank, classic, try to take their money out, which is when they had to stop withdrawals. And that's when Bankman freed, he couldn't find other investors, and he filed for bankruptcy. And, and amid this chaos, when there is this run on FTX, what is Sam Bankman fried doing? How is he responding? One of the most extraordinary things about covering this story, Manveen, is like how everything that has happened has just been very publicly available, including the chief executives of these businesses and SBF, talking to the public very openly. So while this was going on, SBF showed very strange behaviour on Twitter, at one point tweeting, what happened, one letter at a time? Um, <laughs> and, one, one letter at a time? Uh, yes, yeah, so we were getting, you know, every few minutes and then every hour another letter to com- complete the sentence. And then he did an interview with a, with a crypto journalist on Twitter messages where he sort of mocked his own business. It was very odd. Uh, and he mocked his calls for regulation, essentially saying he'd been making up that he wanted crypto to be regulated. And I don't know if I can say this on the podcast, but the, one of his phrases was, man, all the dumb shit I said. Wow. I mean, you're right. That's not what you expect to hear from somebody in the middle of a crisis. That's not likely to inspire much confidence in people who might step in and help him. You'd assume the lawyers would would stop it. Well, um, you would assume that. It's interesting. So after the collapse, SBF embarked on an extremely strange, I thought, round of media interviews for a week, a live broadcast into the New York Times Dealbook Summit. He did a sit-down interview with an ABC Breakfast News anchor. So they flew their anchor over to the Bahamas to sit down with him. Wow. And, and it was uh, broadcast in the way that only American breakfast television can do with a lot of drama around it. This was really something, a wild interview. Almost two hours we sat down. It felt at times like a therapy session. He took every tough question. He wanted to speak out. Let's take a look. Hmm. He spoke to the Financial Times. He spoke to Bloomberg. And journalists were given free reign to quiz him on exactly what had gone on. It was absolutely extraordinary. And when he's doing these, what's his explanation? What's what's the story he's trying to sell? He kept saying, look, I was the chief executive. I was ultimately responsible. But (laughs) he would say I was spread thin. I wasn't very grounded. I lost track of what was going on. There are a lot of people who are involved in that process. And look, I really deeply wish that I had taken like a lot more responsibility for understanding. Um, I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I, I was ultimately absolutely like I look, I should have been on top of this. And I feel really, really bad and regretful that I wasn't. And a lot of people got hurt. And that that's on me. So there was a sort of element of, yes, I'm going to take responsibility here because I was in charge, but actually I didn't really know what was going on. I mean, that sort of makes it sound like a case of a really badly managed company. Clearly it was more than that, though, because at the start of December, he gets arrested. What is he charged with at the time? One of the um, important things that was going on just before he got arrested was the former administrator of Enron, who's a guy called John Ray, took over as chief executive of FTX and was basically left responsible for sorting out the mess and kind of unpicking what was going on, trying to get money back to people. John Ray released a series of filings which said he'd never seen such a mess in his entire career. And this is a veteran executive who oversaw the collapse of Enron. So it really shows you just how bad things were. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced, non-sophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. 
He said that, you know, payments were signed off by emojis on Slack. Sam Bankman-Fried was given a billion dollar loan to himself that he signed off. Property was bought for staff in the Bahamas. So this was all coming out, all of these revelations, while he was doing it's these... extraordinary. ...media interviews. Absolutely extraordinary. He's still in the Bahamas at this point, where he's doing these media interviews from. And he gets arrested on fraud charges. There are eight fraud charges relating to money laundering, and he's extradited to the US just before Christmas. How big is the gap, the missing money, effectively? How much have customers lost? The biggest problem he's got, he says, is there are absolutely no records whatsoever. So he says he's never overseen this sort of collapse before of a business this size, which has no financial records, not even just no financial records, no HR records. And I think overall, we're looking at about $8 billion. What what really struck me, though, I mean, when you talk about what happened, is John Ray in front of Congress, when asked how this compared to Enron, said... Enron was quite sophisticated. People were trying to cover things up at Enron. December 2nd, 2001, the day of the bankruptcy was a Sunday. The very next day, Monday, 4,000 Enron employees were thrown out of work, many of them onto the street behind me. Ultimately, more than 20,000 had their careers uprooted. Many lost all their retirement savings. The people at the top lost their dignity. They became national villains. Some went to prison. For the man at the very top, It was a sudden and total fall from grace. At FTX, he said, this is just good old-fashioned fraud. This is really old-fashioned embezzlement. This is just taking money from customers and using it for your own purpose. Not sophisticated at all. Now, remember earlier how Katie described Sam Bankman-Fried's two businesses, There's Alameda Research, which is like a hedge fund or investment bank, and used to make investments or bet on trades, whereas FTX was more like a traditional bank for storing funds. The connection between the two pillars of his empire could be the key to his downfall. In a classic bank, you're not allowed to mingle the funds between the two. That's against the law. In crypto, there's no regulation. You shouldn't do it, but certainly it's been exposed that the funds were what's called co-mingled. It certainly looks like, and what he's being accused of, is using FTX, using customers' cash, as like a piggy bank. So customer money would be put with FTX, and then it was used to plug holes in Alameda's balance sheet, but also to make the political donations we were talking about earlier to buy property for staff. Money that customers were depositing with FTX was transferred over to the hedge fund and funds were used interchangeably between the two. So what that means is if you've put some money with FTX, you can't guarantee it's safe. Mm. And that's exactly what's happened. Is this basically a Ponzi scheme? It does look that way. And certainly that's what prosecutors are alleging. One of the phrases that got used in in one of the bankruptcy filings was, this is the emperor's new clothes. Wow. Sam Bankman-Fried wasn't the only one who was arrested during that period. His girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, and the co-founder of FTX, Gary Wang, they were also arrested and they very quickly started to talk. Tell us a bit about what we've learned from them um, and, and what's happened to them. Well, I think this is going to be really difficult for Sam Bankman-Fried because you've got his two top lieutenants who were with him the entire time in the Bahamas and really should have known everything that was going on in the business. And they have pleaded guilty and they're cooperating with the authorities. So they've admitted fraud. If we look at what Caroline Ellison said during her plea hearing, she spoke to the relationship between FTX and Alameda. She said she knew what was happening was wrong and that she was in agreement as well with Sam Bankman-Fried to not publicly disclose that Alameda was then going on to loan billions of dollars to FTX executives. She 
She also said that Sam Bankman-Fried herself and others had created balance sheets that made the financial health of Alameda look better than it actually was. Sam Bankman-Fried has pleaded not guilty. So this, I think, will, will be problematic when the next hearing comes around in October. Their evidence could be used against him. And Katie, what's happened to Sam Bankman-Fried now, after the arrest? He's currently at his parents' house in California waiting for his trial on a $250 million bond, which is secured against his parents' house. I mean, that's an extraordinary sum. Huge, but no one expects him to go anywhere. As you said, he is pleading not guilty, despite what his former colleagues have said. What's his defence? How does he explain that? We'll have to wait for the next hearing to to find out exactly what his argument's going to be. But from the round of media interviews that he did, he did say, I just wasn't aware of what was going on. He said, I, I was cocky. I was distracted. There wasn't enough risk management in the business. But he wouldn't admit criminal fraud. So I imagine... It'll be something along those lines. Perhaps even he'll try and push the blame onto his lieutenants. Carolyn Ellison says you knew that FTX funds were being funneled to Alameda. Did you know that? I knew that there is an open margin position there and that that involved I know, but that's not what I'm asking. (laughs) If she's in court and you're in court and she's under oath and you're under oath and you're asked, did you know that these funds were being funneled to Alameda. What is your answer? I did not know that there is any improper uh, use of customer funds. I mean, it will be a a heck of a trial. What what does happen next? Where, Where does this go? So he is now waiting for the next hearing, which is in October. And in the meantime, John Ray and his team at FTX are trying desperately to get people's money back. Because you've got to remember that at the heart of this, a lot of people have lost a lot of money. And these aren't just the blue chip investors that we spoke about. This is the man and woman on the street who trusted their money with this business. Yeah. I mean, we can't underestimate just the the scale of losses that some people will have experienced over this, which is devastating. As you said earlier on, this came at a time where there were already scandals in the crypto world. Do you think this will shake people's trust in that world? Yes, absolutely. It's affecting the crypto industry. It's completely shaking it up. We're seeing withdrawals from a lot of the exchanges. People are far more wary about putting their money into it. The UK earlier this year said that it wanted London to be a crypto hub. That now seems to have gone away. I think it's exposed real flaws in the industry, which is still, it's fair to say, a wild west in finance. You know, if you put your money in a bank, there's a certain amount of protection that you're afforded if something goes wrong. There are regulatory bodies that are looking at how that bank uses your money. When it comes to crypto, there's nothing there. Uh, A lot of these crypto businesses are tied together. There's an immediate fallout, but I think, as as you kind of alluded to, there's a philosophical fallout as well. Looking back now, having seen how this this story ended and how it's sort of blown up, are there also questions about the cult of celebrity in finance, the idea of political donations and charity winning you an air of respectability? You know, will, will people look twice at that in the future? I mean, it is completely extraordinary, isn't it, that all of these extremely respectable people and extremely respectable businesses supported FTX and SBF and almost seemed to feed off one another because if one person backed him, then they lent him that air of credibility um, without perhaps really peering under the bonnet of what was going on, looking at the trappings that he had as a billionaire, perhaps without questioning where that money was coming from. And what's quite interesting is there is a lawsuit going on at the moment, which is suing the celebrities who promoted FTX for encouraging people 
to invest and who ultimately lost their money. But, you know, gosh, there's so many examples of this through history. Is this going to, to change anything? People, people get swept away by things. I think it might change crypto, but I'm sure, as we saw with other examples of entrepreneurs who've perhaps turned out not to be what we expected, this does happen time and time again. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, the business technology editor at The Times, Katie Prescott. You can find all of Katie's work at thetimes.co.uk with a subscription or in print. The producers today were Sam Chantarasak and Oliver Adamson. The executive producer is Kate Ford, and sound design was by David Crackles. If you can, please do leave us a review and help others to find us. Thanks again for listening. See you tomorrow.